afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our annual leadership lecture. This afternoon, we're going to be hearing from our Chief Executive of the Year winner for 2020, Paul Rees, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and he's going to be talking to us about the twin challenges of the pandemic and EDI. Um, and I will introduce Paul. I'm delighted that Paul can join us. Um, Paul, as many of you know, is the Chief Executive of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and as I mentioned before, the winner of the 2020 Memcom Chief Executive of the Year, Year Award. So over to you, Paul. Great, thank you very much, uh, Debbie, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all, and uh, nice to see uh, Sandy Mather and Claire, I guess in particular, my former colleagues from the RCGP. So when I joined the Royal College of Psychiatrists as its new chief executive back in November 2016, I was joining an organisation that was 175 years old and steeped in history. Henry Maudsley, after whom the world famous Maudsley Hospital in London is named, was a former president. And much great work had been done by many college members and many members of staff to promote the specialty of psychiatry and the need for modern, well-resourced mental health services. However, the organisation was old fashioned in many ways. It had no employee engagement strategy and it had no strategy to improve member experience. And despite being a large charity with 18,000 members at the time and 220 staff, it didn't actually have any stated values. So in the autumn of 2017, having been in post for almost a year and having put in place a modernisation programme for the organisation, my SMT colleagues and I decided it was time for us to turn our attention to adopting a set of values. Now, I must admit that at this stage, I thought that creating a set of values was a bit of a tick box exercise, something you had to do, and then you moved on to something else, something that summed up vague aspirations, but little more than that. How wrong I was. Now, at the start of the process, our SMT pulled together a draft set of values. These were courage, innovation, respect, collaboration and excellence. So why did we choose this particular set of values? Well, we chose courage because doctors in other specialties have traditionally looked down upon psychiatry and said that it's just about mental health. So we decided that the RC Psych had to be courageous in order to promote the benefits of psychiatry. After all, if we didn't do that, who else would? We chose innovation because medical world colleges can be traditional and conservative with a small c, but the world out there was changing very fast and we wanted to encourage our staff to continuously uh, think about how to do things better and in a different way. We chose respect because with a diverse workforce and membership, we wanted everyone to be clear that we all had to be respectful to other people regardless of their characteristics or their backgrounds. We chose collaboration because traditionally the 13 specialties and subspecialties of psychiatry and the eight college departments had operated as separate silos, and we wanted everyone to work together as one college. We chose excellence because the emphasis had previously been on doing things the college way, but we wanted to prioritize delivering excellence in membership and staff experience. So having drawn up these five values, along with a set of behaviors for each one, we consulted with our 220 strong staff team. Now 25% of our employees gave written feedback during the consultation, and one person persuasively suggested that we should add learning to our set of values as we were proactively trying to encourage our staff team to learn from projects and work streams that didn't go well and from those that did so that we didn't repeat the same mistakes. The consensus among our staff was that they liked our attempt to create a set of organisational values and behaviours. And we then put our amended set of values, including learning, to our two governing committees our board of trustees and our council. Now one or two members of these committees questioned whether we really needed values and asked whether the concept of values was just a management wheeze or a fad. Eventually, however, both tiers of governance signed them off and we were given permission to officially launch our values of courage, innovation, respect, collaboration, learning, and having been given the green light to launch the values, that in my mind was pretty much the end of the issue. We'd set out to get the organisation to sign up to a set of values, and now that had been done. The values box had been ticked. However, at about the same time, I'd taken on the executive coach, John Frost, who I'd worked with before and who is taking part in today's event, to provide coaching to our SMT, our heads and our middle managers. 
And at his first session with the SMT, knowing that our trustees and council had just signed off the values, John said to us, well done for getting the value signed off, but you do realize that's the easy bit, to which I thought, what's he talking about? That was actually a pretty challenging task to get a whole college to sign up to a set of values. I certainly didn't think we'd be having to put much more effort into this particular piece of work. But John said he thought, having got the value signed off, we were now at a crossroads. He said that most organizations agree their values, post them on their internet, and then forget all about them. They leave them on the shelf gathering dust. Whereas only a minority of organizations go on to proactively put their values at the heart of everything they do, with their values becoming a touchstone for all of their key decisions. And at that point, John asked us which model did we want to follow? And I'm pleased to say that within just one minute, we'd all agreed we wanted to adapt the, la the latter model for the college. John warned us that becoming a values-based organization is a much tougher route to take. He said that the staff team would expect us to model the values and behaviors at all, at all times and deal robustly with anyone transgressing, whatever their level within the hierarchy. He said that from his experience, it was inevitable that complaints would be made about some senior and high performing members of staff and that everyone would be looking to see how we dealt with such people. He continued to say that being a values-based organization isn't easy. However, he went on to say that the rewards would be great because staff morale and engagement would be higher as a result, which in turn would lead to greater productivity and happier members. So we left that meeting with John with a certain sense of trepidation. And a day or two later, we officially launched our values and told our staff team that the values and behaviors would become the yardstick by which everything would be considered. And as John had predicted, within just a few days, we'd received two serious complaints about alleged bullying and harassment by senior and high-performing members of the team. The allegations were such that in most organizations, the temptation would have been to look the other way or ask the respective staff members to make a low-key apology of some sort and move on. But we'd promised to live out our values and keep them center stage. And we'd pledged to John that any bullying behaviors would be robustly dealt with in order to adhere to the values and in order to demonstrate that we were adhering to them. So having followed the appropriate HR steps, we eventually exited each of these two people. With those two departures, our staff team could see that we were serious about living out our values and that we were serious about our promise under our value of respect to take a zero tolerance approach towards bullying and harassment. In fact, since we've introduced our values in April 2018, we've exited five members of staff for bullying and harassment. And I would argue that any organization that says it's values based must take an equally robust approach towards people exhibiting bullying behaviors. So what else have we done since introducing the values? Well, we've visited three excellent organizations very early on in the process that are renowned for being strong in the way they live out their values. Change, Grow, Live, Oxford University Hospitals, NHS Trust, and Mersey Care. And we asked them how it's done. Their staff teams were very generous with their time. And I, along with our director of HR, Marcia Cummings, will be eternally grateful for the help and support they provided us. Each of these three organizations said we were free to cherry pick their best ideas. So that is what we did. Having taken up their hints and tips, we've given coaching to all of our managers in how to manage in a values-based way. We've amended our appraisal process so the staff are appraised in their performance against the values and behaviors, as well as against their objectives. We've produced a document for all of our staff called Living Out Our Values, which tells them what behaviors we would love to see, what behaviors we want to see, and what behaviors we don't want to see. We've changed the staff recognition awards so that they are now awards for meeting our values. We've introduced values-based interviewing alongside interviews based on competencies. We've started to celebrate the major diversity events such as Pride, Black History Month, International Women's Day, and World Mental Health Day as key events on our calendar. We've also introduced our own bespoke event called South Asian History Month to celebrate the contribution of doctors and members of South Asian origin. We talk about the values at our induction events and at our staff briefings. We've also got a section on our values on our website and on our internet. We've promoted the values to our members through our events and our publications. We've introduced a speaker diversity policy so that the speakers at every RC site member event must be diverse in terms of gender and ethnicity. And our senior elected members regularly refer to our values in their speeches. After almost three years of the values being in existence, their impact on the organization is clear. 
at the end of 2020, we ran our latest star survey. Now, as you'll know, any participation rate of 60% or more in a staff survey is considered to be very good and indicative of a high level of staff engagement. This time round, we had a turnout of 85%. All the results are up on our 2017 staff survey, which was the last staff survey that was done before the introduction of the values. So if we can have the first slide, please, uh, Jenny. Uh, as you can see, I've put together this infographic which shows the key results in the survey. Now, since 2017, the year before the values were launched, the percentage of staff rating the morale as high or very high has increased from 47% to 63%, and that's despite the fact that survey was carried out in the midst of a pandemic. The percentage of staff who feel their work is valued by the RC site has increased from 28% to 72%. The percentage of staff who understand the strategic direction of the college has increased from 46% to 62%. And the percentage of staff who think our s and provides consistent and effective leadership has increased from 35% to 75%. Okay, Jenny, if we could take the slide down now, please, that would be great. So what is the impact of having an engaged and a motivated workforce? Well, during the last few years, as employee engagement has improved, staff performance has been enhanced. We've achieved record outputs across all of our key indicators. And this trajectory of improvement really came to a head in 2020 as we battled with the impact of the pandemic. With a highly motivated IT department and project management team, we switched to being an effective virtual organization overnight on the 18th of March with 99% of staff fully functional at home the day after we decided to close our offices. In partnership with the NHS, we published guidance for doctors on how to deliver effective mental health services in the midst of a pandemic just two weeks after the start of the lockdown. Our web pages containing this guidance have been viewed almost 500,000 times, with almost a quarter of those views coming from outside the UK, which means this section has helped our international members as well as our UK members. We were one of the first medical royal colleges to successfully digitize our entrance exam in psychiatry so that all junior doctors could take the three papers that are part of our exam from their homes without putting themselves at risk of contracting COVID-19 with 2,300 candidates sitting at least one part of our three exam papers virtually last year. Despite having never run a webinar before the first lockdown, we went on to deliver one of the biggest webinar programs of all the medical royal colleges with 75,000 live and on-demand member views. And within this, we introduced a large paid for webinar program with 27,600 live and on-demand views for specialist paid for content. We generated record levels of media coverage for our message that the pandemic has hugely affected the mental health of the nation. We continue to run our successful campaign to encourage trainee doctors to choose psychiatry and choosing which medical specialty to go into with 100% of psychiatric training places in the UK being filled for the first time ever in 2020. We continue to run our quality improvement collaboratives to help improve quality in mental health services in what is one of the biggest quality improve, improvement initiatives in mental health in the world. We switched all of our visits to mental health services for the purposes of accreditation from being face-to-face -to, -face to being online. We turned our face-to-face -face training into digital training and delivered a number of successful digital ceremonies with excellent member feedback. So in summary, during the course of 2020, we migrated all of our activities to virtual platforms. Now, in line with our values, we've also continued to support our staff at this difficult time. We run virtual events most days at 3 p.m., including a weekly staff briefing addressed by me as CEO. We've continued to provide our staff team with wellbeing advice and offer anyone with mental health problems full end-to-end -end mental health support 24 hours a day. We've also managed to dramatically improve our financial situation. At the start of the first lockdown, we were projecting the loss of several million pounds However, we're now predicting a total loss of less than £1 million overall. This has been achieved by making a number of efficiency savings without making a single member of the college staff team redundant and by earning substantial income from new online activities. Overall, we've adapted to the challenges of COVID-19 well, continued to deliver services to frontline NHS doctors and mental health services while ending the year financially in good shape. But how have we done this? Well, we believe that everything points back to our values and behaviours. Our values were so well embedded right at the start of the pandemic that the right behaviours and attitudes 
were in place right across our staff team from the very beginning. This meant that everyone was doing their best to be innovative, collaborative, courageous and respectful in everything they did. And everyone was clear that it was important that, what, uh, that we learned what worked well and what didn't. Now our focus on our values also informed the way we responded to the tragic murder of George Floyd back in May. My own personal response was that while I felt sickened by what had happened, this was sadly just another assault on a black man by the American police and had little to do with the RC psych. But then having received strong feedback from our staff team who'd been encouraged to raise issues and concerns with management uh, that we should be doing something on the issue, we decided as an SMT in conjunction with our senior members that using our values as a guide, this was something we had to react to. Within days, we've become one of the first medical royal colleges to post a statement on the homepage of our website condemning all forms of racism. The statement was very well received by our members with one leading psychiatrist saying that statement alone has made more than 30 years of membership fees worth it. I addressed the issue of race and racism in two consecutive staff briefings. Members of our SMT and of our internal African and Caribbean forum held a reflective conversation for our staff team with 40% of staff taking part. We issued a learning resource on race and racism on our intranet, which quickly became the most downloaded document in the history of our intranet site. And then having seen a number of prominent black leaders issue statements and videos on their experiences, my wife Sue, without whom I could never have become a chief executive, who happens to be white, said to me, you will have to do something as well. Initially, I felt reluctant to do something like that as I don't really like talking about myself and I never for one minute thought that I would talk about my colour and my experiences of racism within the realms of my role. But having thought about it, I realised that if I was going to stay true to our values, I had to write a blog about my experiences, highlighting the fact that on the one hand, I'm a senior person at an establishment organisation, while on the other, I'm a black man living in Western Europe and therefore have inevitably experienced racism throughout my life, being stopped repeatedly by the police in my earlier years for no good reason, being stared at and assaulted while on holiday in Spain, and being sent racist messages through the post when I was a national journalist covering the Stephen Lawrence case. When I wrote the blog, I shared it with the then RC site president, Wendy Byrne, and president-elect, Dr. Adrian James, to make sure that they were comfortable with me sharing my experiences with the staff team. They both replied within minutes, saying they found the blog very moving and asking if it could be shared with all of our now 19,000 members, as well as with our staff team. Naturally, in line with our values, Equality, diversity and inclusion is one of our top priorities. Just over 12 months ago, we won Charity of the Year in the European Diversity Awards. And when the government announced that organisations didn't need to do a gender pay review last year because of the pandemic, we knew immediately that based on our values, we would still want to do one. And in July, our incoming president, Adrian James, pledged that in line with our values, he wanted us to produce a new equality strategy. We started work on this in the summer, and last week we published the strategy which is called the RC Psych Equality Action Plan. The strategy contains 29 key performance indicators and sets out a clear timetable for delivery. Our decision to publish a new equality strategy, along with our early decision to celebrate events such as Pride, Black History Month, International Women's Day, and South Asian History Month, has been transformational, with many female, Black, Asian, and minority ethnic, and LGBTQ members getting in touch to say that for the first time, they feel fully included and valued as members. It's been transformational on the staff side too. And according to our recent staff survey, 85% of staff say they think that we are a good employer when it comes to equality, diversity and inclusion. It's hardly likely that without our values, much of this work would never have happened. Now, back in September, I was lucky enough to be awarded the Memcom Louis Armstrong CEO Leadership Award. The RC Psych also won the award for the best integrated marketing campaign for our Choose Psychiatry Workstream. I feel sure that without our values, we wouldn't have won either of these awards. As the driver for much of our excellent work as an organisation over the last two and a half years has been the college values. Now, back in autumn 2017, I started off by thinking that introducing a set of values was a tick box exercise. But ever since then, I've been on a journey. And I now see that putting values at the heart of an organisation is a must in order to drive good behaviours, high performance 
and an excellent member and staff experience. Okay, so Jenny, if you could uh, put up the next slide, please. Um, that concludes my presentation. And if you'd like any more information on anything I've said, please feel free to get in touch with my excellent EA, Angelica Allo, whose details are on the screen at this very moment. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks very much, Paul, for your very candid and um, moving and motivating talk there. And you, you mentioned your blog, which um, we will, we've, we've hosted on our site and we will send that round to everybody because that's, that's very moving. Uh, Sorry, I'm speaking in the dark. A couple of technical problems there. Um, thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, and I'm sure we'll have lots of follow on discussion uh, throughout the afternoon. Um, we have a couple of a few minutes for a couple of minutes for some questions before we go into the next um, session. Do use the chat function. And if you want to put your cameras on now um, to everyone in the audience, then please feel free to do so. Um, one of the questions that we've had um, posted earlier, in your view, did the, how did the Black Lives Matter protests in summer 2020 change the urgency of EDI within organisations generally? Uh, well, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think that uh, clearly, uh, uh, obviously from my experience, anyone who's black or Asian or minority ethnic in the UK, uh, you know, had that sense of urgency prior to George Floyd because they uh, had these experiences and it was a reality for them. I think uh, the uh, George Floyd episode, however, clearly brought it to the attention of everyone else uh, across uh, the world. Um, and I think that uh, lots of organisations, you know, realised they really had to do something and make this an absolutely key issue. Um, and I think it's been a, a fantastic motivating force. Um, I think that uh, within England and America in particular, lots of corporate organisations have produced equality, diversity and inclusion strategies actually in the time since the George Floyd case. Um, and I think the key thing is uh, to ensure that um, having produced the strategy, people then don't um, sort of walk away from it uh, because that's what happens in organisations. Often you, you do a lot of work, you publish a strategy and then um, um, you've got lots of other priorities and you move on to something else. So I think it's really important with EDI strategies, as with other strategies, to have a clear timetable for delivery so that having made this issue key for the organisation, you know, you ensure that it's centre stage um, and you keep on trying to make sure you deliver against that, uh, you know, over a set period of time. Great. Thank you for that. That's really useful. And no doubt, um, yeah, the debate set to continue with the uh, American election uh, inauguration yesterday. Uh, hopefully we can see a, a, a new wave of positivity coming through. Um, we have a question here from Marcia Philbin. Um, do you think that engagement with the values may have been improved by involving staff, trustees and members at the outset so that they made the suggestions for values before shortlisting them? Um, so uh, we had a long conversation right at the start. I remember, you know, where do you actually start with values? If you literally have a blank sheet of paper, which we had, do you try and uh, have a start of a 10? The SMT, you know, generates and then share it with staff. Do you get the staff to come up with the start of a 10? You know, do you get the trustees to do that? Do you get the council to do that? We decided that we would do it as an SMT. There had been an abortive attempt to introduce values at the RT site about five years before. Uh, the project was started, but it, unfortunately, because of a number of internal issues, it you know, never got over the line. So we started with those, we tweaked them a bit, and then we shared them with staff. Uh, when we launched them, I did a post on the blog, and then we did a town hall meeting, and probably about 70% of our staff attended. We published a questionnaire and we asked our staff to feedback and 25% of staff did feedback and they really did shape um, the, the content of our values and behaviours. Uh, and actually we then had meetings, town hall meetings with our heads and with our middle managers. And actually probably I'd say 50% of our final published values and behaviours were shaped by the staff feedback. Um, and I've got to say the engagement with our values is um, certainly off the scale compared to what I'd initially expected. When I've worked in other organisations um, as a director, the values tend to be things that, you know, were published at some point. Most people can't remember them. So I've even worked in organisations where half of the SMT didn't even know if they had values. And I it was the third or fourth person on the SMT when I started that I asked who said, actually, we do have values. Um, actually, at the RC site, we found that all of our staff know them. They know them inside out. And actually, colleagues now refer to them naturally in conversations but I think you've got to do all the things I've mentioned there are about you know 10 or 15 different activities you have to do 
values-based interviewing, um, training in the values for managers, uh, values guides for staff, uh, uh, you have to do repeatedly. And actually, um, one of the organizations we went to visit early on, Change, Grow, Live, the chief exec said, you've got to bang on about the values every time you do a, a staff briefing and do a staff induction. And I, I forced myself to do that. And actually, um, you know, the staff team have responded really well and they do love the values and they are always quoting them and actually um, holding themselves to account um, in line with our values. Great, thank you, Paul. Do we have any other questions before we go to the breakout round tables? Oh, Simon, Simon Thompson, let's just uh, unmute. Oh uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, hi Paul, thanks for a really Simon. interesting uh, uh, presentation. To what extent do you feel that the values that you um, articulated were an expression of the values the organisation already had? To what extent were they a sort of aspirational set of values that you wanted to work towards? Um, that's a really good question. I think they were pretty aspirational actually in that um, uh, I've got to say some of the values really weren't that to the fore, so collaboration at the time, you know, we were uh, very silo based, that had just been the way things had worked. Um, uh, and so we looked at uh, the various uh, things we wanted the organisation to achieve. So it was aspirational. And we said, this is what we want. We may not have it yet. Uh, and we tested it out with our staff. Uh, and our staff team responded, well, they, they wanted collaboration. They wanted to work more closely with other colleagues. They wanted the different subspecialties within psychiatry to work more closely together. They wanted a much stronger emphasis on excellence. Um, and I think it was important that when we talked about excellence, we talked about it in terms of excellence of member experience and excellence of um, staff experience. So they were brought in from, from the start. So I would say they were mostly aspirational. Um, and at the time, you know, there was quite a long stretch to reach them. But I think if you sort of make sure that they are a touchstone week in, week out in the end, they just become part of who you are and they create the foundations for a culture. And when we launched the values, we said we were launching them because we wanted to create a culture that was positive, enabling and empowering. Uh, and all the staff team and members, you know, signed up to that. There was a slight challenge in that uh, a number of members, you know, you know very learned doctors. There was a, a bit of pushback about, is this just a management fad? Is this management speak? Um, and is this just for the staff? There was a, there was a debate about that. And I made the case to our elected officers, this has got to be for the members as well as for the staff. If it's seen as just being for the staff, it will die a death. And initially, I think the elected members who you know, are very learned people were, you know, were wondering, was it a management fad? But I think after about only a couple of weeks, really, they really got into it. And I'm really pleased and grateful to them because you know, they started to incorporate reference to values in all of their speeches and now I can't talk to the president or vice president without them referring to the values at least, you know, two or three times in every catch up. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that question as, as well, Simon. Um, one final question, I think, before we go to the breakouts um, from Alex, uh, oh, coming through thick and fast now, Alex Skinner. Um, do you find staff vocally supportive when you act on your values? You mentioned the issue of bullying, for example, and how do you recognise staff for demonstrating the values and behaviours in their work? Um, so uh, that's a very good question. So I think uh, whenever you launch values from a standing store position and you say they're going to be set to stage, clearly a lot of the staff team are going to be suspicious and think it's a bit of a, a PR exercise. Um, as it happens for us, uh, one of the you know one of the cases I mentioned uh, uh, came to a head pretty quickly, um, and uh, staff could see that we dealt with it in an incredibly robust way. And I think to be honest. Quite a few staff were shocked that actually we tackled it and tackled it incredibly robustly within a very, very short period of time, which I think that was a key moment, if you like, for the staff to think, actually, this is serious. Um, in terms of how we recognise our staff, um, we've, we've changed uh, all of the staff recognition awards so that they're all based on the values. Uh, we um, have staff awards roughly every once, uh, once every two months and staff get £100 in vouchers. Uh, if, they, if they've done great work in line with the values. Um, I think what's interesting is that we spend a lot of time saying thank you to staff. Um, uh, so I always feed back to staff how grateful we are for the work they've done. I, I do it, you know, almost every staff briefing and I try and find different examples of where, you know, a senior member has said it or a councillor has said it or the trustee board. Um, and um, I try to make sure that as an SMT, when great work 
bits of work has happened. Obviously, there'll be SMT involvement, but there'll also be other people who've delivered. I'll try and emphasise the other people and the role they've played. And I think uh, the, the impact of that is seen in, in the results that I think, I can't remember the exact figures, but in that slide I showed um, at the start of the values, only about a quarter of staff felt that they, you know, the organisation valued them for their input, and now it's 75%. Um, and so I think, you know, that kind of speaks volumes. But it is something, as John Frost said, you know, you honestly, uh, uh, I did go into this thinking, you know, we just get the values agreed, put them on a poster and walk away. It's something you've got to work on every day. At every SMT, we talk about the values and how decisions are shaped by them. The George Floyding was a good example. Without the values, we probably wouldn't have been really robust on it. But once, uh, you know, staff raised it with us, having been encouraged to raise issues, we were clear. We absolutely had to do it and we had to go big on it, had to put it on our home page. And also that was why I felt the blog was a clear thing I had to do, even though I felt uncomfortable. And uh, the rest of the SMT, you know, I said, this is what I think I should do. What do you think? And they all said, yeah, in line with our values, absolutely, that's what we should do. So it's about trying to follow through on them every day. And of course, no one's perfect. We'll all fail, you know, at times, uh, but it's about trying to just make sure you get back on the wagon and just keep the values centre stage. And it can almost sound a little bit like a kind of um, a religious cult uh, once you really get into values. Um, and um, one of the people who advised us um, uh, was uh, Mersey Care NHS Trust. She talked about values leading to a righteous culture. And she said some people find that a bit, you know, a bit of an awkward phrase because it does sound a bit maybe quasi-religious um, and, and zealous, but I think that's the way we do see it and the, the way in which it transforms people's behaviours, not just in terms of being respectful, but actually in productivity has gone through the roof since we introduced them. And I was talking to our sort of key admin person, she's my EA and office manager, and she said that since she started, which was at about the time we introduced the values, the productivity of each admin person has increased by about 100%. And where, whereas you used to have two people to do a particular admin role, you just need one person now because productivity has increased that much because people feel a lot more happy and, uh, and valued. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions, Paul, actually, if you're happy to take these before of we course, get yeah, of course. Them while the conversation's going. Um, Mark uh, Whaley, Wally um, has, has asked, the two people you moved on after complaints, um, were there signs clearly in advance or were the complaints and the need to move on to them a surprise? So I think, I think if we're all honest, if we think about organisations either we work at now, or we've worked at in the past, we all know there are people that exhibit bullying behaviours. And uh, I've seen it, you know, I've looked, worked at various organisations, I've seen it at other organisations. And obviously inside you're kind of thinking, oh, I wish someone would do something about this. And in the end, nothing really happens. So uh, our uh, environment was the same as that really. Um, our, but what was interesting was um, people weren't complaining about those behaviours to us until we published the values and we said these are now going to be the touchstone for this organization we are going to you know uh, live and breathe these and uh, part of the values one of the behaviors under our um, value of respect is zero tolerance towards bullying john frost said if you introduce these and say they'll be center stage you'll get complaints within days literally the day after we'd launched them someone was knocking at my door and the day after that someone else knocked at my door um, and uh, in the past, other places I've worked at, those people would still have remained at those organisations, uh, but uh, we went through a due process and we exited them and it was the right thing to do. And what's interesting is another person outside of those initial two who we did exit, I had a conversation with someone, Sarah Hughes, I hope I get the name of the organisation right, from the Centre for Mental Health, and she took part in a government study and a paper that came out about two years ago, I think, on bullying within the charity sector. And I talked her through the case that I just dealt with that had led to someone being exited. And she said, wow, in most charities, that person wouldn't have been exited. And she said that was really courageous. So she was sitting in my office, this is in the old days before COVID, uh, and I had a massive values poster on my wall. And I said, oh, if you look, if you turn around and look at our values, you'll see the top value is courage. So we live and breathe, you know, that is an article of faith. And it was, you know, it does take courage because as a chief executive, when you uh, decide you've got to take that action uh, and you take that, you know, ultimate step, 
you get quite a lot of pushback from senior members, people on the trustee board, and others saying, you know, do we really want to get rid of this person? This person's critical to us. Our performance in area A, B, or C will decline if this person moves on. And you've got to say uh, that is possible, um, uh, you know, for a short period. But it's a, this is our values, and this is an article of faith. And if we're living by our values, we have to take this step. And what happens is clearly there's a bit of you know upset commotion for a very short period of time, a couple of weeks. You get someone else brilliant in who lives the values, and within two or three months, everyone's forgotten about it, apart from those members of staff who are affected who see the organisations acted, and they feel um, empowered, if you like, uh, by that. Process. What I should add is we've also introduced a, an outside person people can contact if they have concerns about bullying uh, and this person reports back to us every month and every month there's normally about one person who's raised an issue about bullying but the, the, the volume is, is decreasing over time. Thank you. I think we'll just take one more question and then we'll, we'll go to the breakouts. Um, Rachel James is asking, I'm interested in an understanding how Paul and the team embedded the values with volunteers and officers as a slightly different approach um, that might be required than with staff. Absolutely. So that, that's a very different approach. And my concern at the start was, would this just be values for the staff team? And I know in medical world colleges often, you know, that is a question is it for the staff or is it for the doctors as well? Should the doctors have a different set of values? And you know, they were in a medical royal college, they are volunteers. So the great thing for us was our, our officers were totally supportive of the values. Once, once they were launched and they incorporated reference to the values in every speech they made, they referenced them in, count, in our council, which is like the parliament you know, of psychiatry. Um, uh, we did a massive article on our values um, in our uh, membership magazine. We've got a big section on our values on the website. Um, we've sent out emails to the chairs of all of our committees about the values and how we have to follow them. Uh, our speaker diversity policy was sent out to the chairs of our committees. Um, we, you know, we've highlighted our values via social media. Every channel available to us, we, we, we sort of put them out there. I think for us, the biggest thing actually is uh, uh, honouring, if you like, or marking Pride, Black History Month, uh, South Asian History Month, uh, and International Women's Day, because you know, we're a big charity. Uh, we've got you know, 19,000 members currently, 210 staff at the moment. Um, and you know, uh, we had, until two years ago, we'd never marked those events. And when we chose to mark them in line with our values, we went really big on them. So you couldn't have missed the fact we were celebrating them. We really hammered it home with our members uh, through all our member communications, emails to members, um, big events. And um, I think that showed to people that we were serious about the values and they were core. And now what happens is when you talk to, to, to members, they, they refer to the values um, and it's just part of the mantra We've had an, a series of elections recently, two nationally elected roles came up and the Dean and Treasurer amongst, you know, we've got four elected officers, there are two of them and the, the two winning candidates uh, adhering to the values was a key part of their manifesto. Um, and that's now just seen as the norm within the organisation. Great, thank you. And thank you for everybody for your questions. There's still a couple more coming through, but we'll perhaps try and answer those after the, um, uh, the round table. So thank you very much, Paul. That was really um, enlightening and for your candidness and open openness about um, your journey that you've gone through. We're going to